turn with me this morning to Luke chapter 15. Your New Testament scriptures, Luke chapter 15. We'll look today at verses 11 to 32 in Luke chapter 15. You are at a disadvantage. You've had a good breakfast, and now you have to sit. I, I get at least to stand and talk, so uh, I, I'm with you, and I appreciate you being here so we can uh, spend a few moments together in uh, God's Word today. So Luke chapter 15, and let me begin reading at verse 11. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth and wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death? I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of his servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him, but he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Pray with me once again. Father in heaven, we do thank you for the beauty of your word and the truth that is found in our Savior, the, the words he speaks that give life of celebration and feasting when people return to you when lost things are found. And we give you our sincere thanks for uh, who you are and that you would reveal yourself in such a way to us. So help us today to know you and to draw near to you and to be transformed into this image in our interactions with others. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. When the prophet Nathan needed to confront King David, he employed the strategy of telling a story. He told David about a rich man who had many sheep and cattle and a poor man who had only one lamb. And the lamb is no ordinary lamb. It's the family pet. It grew up with the children. It eats there, it shares the poor man's food and drinks from his cup and even sleeps in his arms. In fact, David Nathan says the lamb is like a daughter to the poor man. It's almost over the top in painting the picture of the love for this lamb. 
But one day a traveler comes to the rich man and instead of using one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for his guests, he steals the one lamb that belongs to the poor man and kills it in order to feed his guest. And David has taken the story as if it was a narrative of something that happened, and he is incensed and declares, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. And that's when Nathan looks at David and says, you are the man. In stealing Bathsheba and murdering her husband Uriah, you have done an act as heinous as the rich man in this parable. And that confrontation illustrates the powerful nature of stories and parables. Stories are good at jolting us to see things in a new way. They don't tell us information, they show it to us. And they allow us to look at reality from a different angle and see ourselves and others in a new light. Parables should leave us asking the question, whom do I line up with in this story? And the passage we've read today is one of Jesus' best-known parables. It's often called the parable of the prodigal son or the lost son. And it's the third story in this chapter. It follows the parables of the lost sheep and the lost coin. And so being the third, the last, and the longest, it's intended to be the climactic parable in this chapter. And of course, as you see from Jesus' final words and from earlier in the chapter, These parables are about finding lost things and the joy that comes when we do. So as we look at this parable this morning, I just invite you to consider which character do you align with? Do you align with the prodigal son or do you align with the older brother? Or are you trying to be like the father? So you keep all those questions in mind as we examine the parable of the prodigal son. And we'll look at it from three angles. The the parable is structured around three main characters. So the first angle is the story of the younger son and the story of Israel in verses 12 through 20. So let's jump into that. Now, many sermons describe the parable, or excuse me, the prodigal son as a Christian who drifts away from his relationship with the Lord, but is later restored. They might even call him a backslider. Do we still use that word? Is is that familiar to you? And one of the reasons people read the parable that way is because the prodigal son is described as a son. And the New Testament describes believers as sons and daughters of God. But I don't think Jesus' original audience would have heard the word son quite that way. I don't think they would have heard it so individualistically or necessarily with that spiritual sense. And here's why. In Exodus 4, the nation of Israel is called God's son. Say to Pharaoh, Israel is my firstborn son. And I told you, let my son go, that he may worship me. The whole nation of Israel, that people, is God's son. They are God's son nationally. Now, it does not mean that each of them have an individual relationship with the Lord as we often phrase it. It doesn't necessarily mean they're all saved, that they all have spiritual life. Remember, Jesus has to tell Nicodemus, you must be born again. So you can be amongst the people of God nationally, but still need that new birth. Just like we can have a church full of people who identify as Christians, and it would be appropriate to call you that, but you may still need to know the Lord, to seek him, and to be saved. So when Jesus talks about a father having two sons, his audience would have thought of Israel, the son of God. They would not have thought of a Christian who drifted from his walk. With God. And one of the reasons they wouldn't have thought that is what are these parables about? They are about heaven rejoicing over sinners who repent. There is a focus on lost things which are found. And Jesus tells these parables in order to give the Pharisees a warning. The the Pharisees are criticizing him. You welcome sinners, you eat with them. And Jesus wants to say, right. Because that's what God's all about. 
the joy of welcoming lost things and celebrating them. So I want you to hear the parable today not about backsliding. I want you to hear about it as God's joy over restoring people to himself. Now let's quickly review the story of the younger son. We've already read it, and the details, I think, are pretty clear. But here's the big idea. The son says to his father, give me my share of the estate. This is not the same thing as the son saying, can you help me with my car loan? Or until I get paid again. When do you normally get an inheritance from your parents? When they die. And so this is a way of the son telling his father, I wish we were already at that point. Or I care more about my money than the fact that you're still alive. And I'm ready to go off and no longer be a part of this family. I'm going to take my cut and I'm going to get out. And so it's a very disrespectful way for a son to talk to his family. Again, in this culture, we we Westerners are more individualistic. But in an Eastern culture, it's more collectivist. Families might live together in close units their whole life in villages of 40 to 80 people where many, many of them were related to one another. So he's saying, I'm just done with all of that. I want my money and I want to go. And so it might not have even been unusual in this culture for a father uh, to have punished a son who acted that way, or thrown him out but not given him money. Instead, this father acts differently. He divides the inheritance. He gives the younger son his portion. And that's when things start to go downhill. The son takes the inheritance into a far country, and he squanders it in wild living. And we don't have to sanitize that. The older brother will accuse the younger of engaging with prostitutes. He goes into a far country and lives a dissolute life. He just says no to his family, his heritage. He lives like a Gentile. And soon he runs into trouble. A severe famine enters the region. All of his money is gone. And in desperation, he hires himself to a Gentile master where he's sent into the fields to feed pigs. And again, try to listen to the story with Jewish ears. This Jewish son is working for a Gentile in a Gentile area, and now he is feeding pigs. He's gotten as low as you can go. But actually, one more step down. He's so hungry, he wants to eat what the pigs eat. And no one will give him anything. He is in total dire straits. And in that low condition, he realizes what he's done. Verse 17 says, when he came to his senses, which I think we can think of the idea of repentance, starting to have an awakening and wanting to turn things around. He realizes how sinfully he's acted. He repents of it, and he just dares to hope that he might receive mercy from his father. He reasons, even the servants are in a better position than I am, and so I'll go back to my father and say, I have sinned against heaven and against you. But in his thinking, because he's done such awful things, he needs to propose a change in the relationship between him and his father. He'll become a servant, a day laborer, no longer a son. Just just a tiny bit of mercy And he'll make it right. And even that, by the way, is taking a risk. What did I say about these villages? Archaeologists tell us probably 40 to 80 people live in these villages. You know what that means. Everybody knows what he's done. He's known, and when he comes home, everybody's going to see him. Just Just a walk back down the street is probably going to be a scandal. But he's going to hope in mercy. And so he sets out to return. Now, before we go to the next section or the next story, the question we ask ourselves is, okay, well, how might I identify with this son? Or how might Jesus' original audience have identified with this son? Well, again, think, Israel is God's son. And when Jesus tells this story of Israel going into a far country, they're to think of their own history, of them going into exile. Because of their disobedience to God. I mean, just think it through. When we read those stories in Kings uh, and Chronicles and Samuel, you see Israel as a whole breaking God's covenant, committing idolatry and other forms of covenant unfaithfulness. That's the son disrespecting his father. 
And then the son goes into a far country. God sends Israel into exile in Assyria, in Babylon, for their unfaithfulness. And in that far country, they come to their senses and repent. It's not perfect when they get back home, but the exile did at least cure Israel of, our, of their idolatry. And they came seeking restoration with the Father. Jesus is telling this whole story in order to say, hey, that restoration that you long for, I'm showing up to bring it about. The time has come to celebrate. The salvation has come. That's why Jesus says you don't fast when the bridegroom's with you. It's a celebration time right now. It's a party time right now. We're celebrating God returning to his people. And he's doing it through me. So Israel, find yourself in the story. And you friends this morning living in our day and age, find yourself in the story. And that there is a God who has come to bring salvation. And he brings it not for Israel alone, but for everyone who finds themselves in spiritual exile. Everyone who finds themselves needing to be rescued from bondage to sin. That God has acted in Christ to end that exile. To find lost sinners and to rejoice over them when they are restored to him. And you may read this story and say, well, I mean, I haven't gone quite down to the depths like the son has. No, perhaps you haven't. But we all, in one way or another, need this reconciling God. We're all like Adam and Eve trying to find wisdom our own way. We're all like Cain trying to run from the presence of God in our own way. And God is here to say, I'm seeking you out. And I long to find you. So just do you know that mercy? And if you know it definitively, you're like, yes, I'm a Christian. I'm saved. I I know God. Do you know God as a God of mercy? Daily, ongoing restoration. A God who longs to find things and love his people. So that's the first part of the story, the story of the son. Now let's go, right, we've kind of already tiptoed into this, but let's look at the story of the father as it connects to the story of Jesus. Because as soon as the son comes home, the father of the two sons takes center stage. In fact, we read, while the prodigal son is still far away from his father's house, his father sees him. And it's often been said, I think it's right on, it probably implies the father was watching for him. That the father longed for his return. And he's filled with compassion, and he runs to greet him. Now, we've already said that For the son to come home to the village would have been a disgrace. But in the name of compassion, the father runs to greet him. And some things we read of Eastern culture imply that would involve humiliation on the father's part. That senior members of a family don't do something like this. It's undignified in their culture. How much more if they've been disrespected by their son? But Jesus will describe the Father in this way because this is what God is like. This is how God has acted in the past towards his sinful people. This is how he will act towards them now. Jeremiah 31, 20 reads, Is not Ephraim my dear son, the child in whom I delight? Though I often speak against him, I still remember him. Therefore my heart yearns for him. I have great compassion for him. For him, declares the Lord. That is the very nature of God on full display here. As he runs out to greet his son, who starts to initiate this conversation. He leads with his repentance. But before he can say the words about becoming a servant, the father interrupts him. I even tried to read it in that way. He's got this rehearsed speech. I've sinned, make me a servant. He gets out the first part before he can say, make me a servant. The father jumps in and says, bring the best robe and put it on. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. I don't think the father is all that interested in hearing his grand promises of repentance. I don't think the father is interested in him getting his apology just right. 
I mean, if you even think about it, it's a poorly constructed apology to begin with. You go hoping in mercy, but you want to barter based on what you'll do. And the father says, I don't need that. Just come home. Just come home and trust in my mercy and we will be restored. And then we're going to throw a party. The father calls for the fattened calf. By the way, that would probably provide enough meat for the whole village. So this isn't just a party at their house. It's like a big family wedding, a big village gathering. And this is, again, Jesus is trying to make this connection with himself. He eats with tax collectors and sinners. That's how the chapter opened. The Pharisees grumbled that he eats and celebrates with tax collectors and sinners. But he says, when God comes back, this is what it will look like. When God comes to bring you home from the far country, when he comes to bring about this promised exodus, this promised salvation, this is what it will look like. He will rejoice with those who repent and celebrate their salvation. Jesus is doing in his ministry what the Father is doing in his salvation, and that calls for mercy. And that is how God will treat you. When you seek him for mercy. That is how Jesus will treat you when you seek him for mercy. And I think this is the challenge that we need to make to ourselves. This is how we should treat one another when people seek us for mercy. And I think, I think we know this on one level. I, I think as Christians, we're, we're primed to say, if an outsider came in this morning and said, I've been living like this prodigal son, and I want to become a Christian, I I think we would celebrate. I I believe we would be genuinely joyful. But what if an insider came back? Or what if one of your own children, who's disrespected you and blown up the relationship, came back? Would you be so quick to, what do we think, folks? We think, oh, they should know better. And because they should know better, this is how they need to be if we're going to restore this relationship. Is that how the father acts here? The son can't even get out his apology, and already the relationship is repaired. So we can all endeavor to be like the father as well. So let's look then at the last story here, the story of the older brother and the story of Jesus' opponents. We celebrate party time, feast time. Not everyone is happy. Look at the story of the older brother. He's out working in the field, probably a supervisor. And so as he begins to make his way home, he's put in a hard day's worth of work. He hears music and dancing, and he calls one of the servants to him. And he says, what is going on? And the servant says, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. Now, again, that makes us happy, but it didn't sit very well with the older brother. Verse 28 tells us he became angry and refused to go in. Now, notice how different that is. From the father's response, the father was moved with compassion. He ran to embrace his son. The older son is angry and will not enter the house. And this is what I think Jesus especially wants us to see in this parable. I've taken both sons as as equally informative. Some even wonder at the point of this parable isn't so much the first son as it is the second But notice that, we we often lose sight of the second, notice that his behavior is scandalous like his brother's. So because he's the older child, he would have had duties at the feast. For him not to know and not to come is to disrespect his father. His father has to go out and plead with him. So the other son is subjecting the father to embarrassment and shame. Everybody knows there's conflict and a problem. Like when you have a big awkward moment at a family gathering, I mean, everybody knows it. And then the, fan, the, the behavior continues in verse 29 when the father does come out. He says, I've served you like a slave. So, Father, you've mistreated me. He says things like, All I wanted was a young goat and I could celebrate with my friends. And you say, Well, what's so bad about that? Well, again, family is very central in this culture. It doesn't mean people didn't have friends. But if you, your family came first in celebrations like this. So if you're saying, well, I want to kill a goat with my friends, it makes it sound like you're saying, my family isn't important to me, which is what the first son did, right? 
The second son is saying, you can count me out for Christmas. You can count me out for the big gathering. So it's an attitude that's very similar to the first sons. And then, of course, the most shameful behavior is he claims, I have never disobeyed your orders. And he refuses to acknowledge his brother's status. He calls him this son of yours. It's like when one of the parents says, do you know what your children did today? I mean, you're your kids too, but you get the point. This son of yours. So now he stands in disagreement with his father's decision to reconcile and restore. He won't join the feast. He will not show compassion to his brother. He claims to be a model son. He is just as alienated as the prodigal in the far country. And it's not too hard to figure out who the older brother represents. The chapter opened by talking about how the Pharisees and the teachers of the law grumble when Jesus receives sinners and eats with them. So Jesus is putting into action the coming of God's salvation. He's eating and drinking with sinners. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law refuse to join in the celebration. Now, why would they do that? Do they not want people to come to Israel's God? I think they do. But they want people to do it their way. In other words, they say, if you're going to be a part of the true people of God, If you're going to be a part of the people of God that get God's blessing in the last day, you've got to do it like this. It's not that they oppose sinners. They don't like the fact that Jesus seems to be giving everybody an easy pass. All you got to do is repent and believe and you can get in the fast lane. No, you've got to do it like us the way we did. We stayed home. We kept the home fires burning. We maintained our loyalty to God while everybody else was out doing their own thing. And now you can just all walk right in when we've been so faithful? No, that is their objection. And and to be crystal clear, that is a problem that all of us can succumb to. The point of this parable is not to say, look at those Jewish Pharisees. I'm so glad that Christian Jesus came and showed us the right way to act because, man, those Jews are so legalistic. The point is to say when any person of any persuasion says, do it my way, and it's a way they've come up with because they've got their own interests and they want to protect the boundaries and they want to make sure that everything's safe, but it's not God's way of mercy then Jesus says you are falling into that camp. And beware of putting any roadblocks, any stumbling block, any hindrance on anyone coming to the merciful God who stands ready to celebrate and feast when he finds lost things. And how, by the way, does the father respond to this older brother the same way he responded to the prodigal son. The behavior may shame him, but he longs to be reconciled. And he leaves the banquet, and he goes out in the field, and he says, my son, you are always with me. Everything I have is yours. You don't have to do anything to enjoy my favor. But we do need to celebrate and be glad. This brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Hey, come in. Come celebrate. Join the party. Let's all be reconciled to God and to one another. And so I just close with these questions again that we had at the beginning. How do we view ourselves? If I was to look inward and be honest before God, am I viewing myself as a model of obedience or do I view myself as one who needs mercy? And if you do need mercy, come to the Father. He'll give it to you. Secondly, am I open? Am I ready? Am I excited? Am I, celebrated? am I celebrating God working mercifully in others, even if I don't think they deserve it? Am I okay with God working mercifully in others if they haven't done it the way I did it, if they didn't follow the path I followed? Are we okay with God working mercifully in them? And are we ready to join that feast and to be God's agents of mercy to the world? And lastly, finally, in this story, the father acts in a way that invites criticism. I've mentioned that several times. He goes against the societal rules of how to deal with children like this, and he does it for their sake. And nothing can make us think more of the gospel than that. 
that Jesus Christ would endure mockery and shame and pain and death to save lost things. And so as we know him and seek to know him, we join together in that great celebration. So let's pray for God's help to do that. Pray with me. Father in heaven, we do come before you. And we thank you that today we can know what you're like. What a beautiful, unhindered picture of the merciful, saving God who reconciles. We, we stand in adoration of you, and we give you our praise and our thanks, and we give you glory for who you are and for your actions towards us. Father, we ask for the forgiveness of our own sins that separate us from you, that cause distance. And Father, we pray for the forgiveness of our own sins when we are uh, unmerciful to others and are not quick to restore and to enjoy uh, reconciliation and to, to celebrate in that. Lord, just change us more into the image of the triune God, the Father, Son, and Spirit who work together in harmony to bring about this kind of salvation. Bear good fruit in our lives. Bear good fruit in our church's life. And thank you so much for your great mercy. And continue, Lord, to bring about this great salvation in our time that more and more may celebrate in you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing in closing this last hymn. Hymn 689, Be Still My Soul. Hymn 689, we'll sing the first and the last. Stand with me, 689, 1 and 4.